The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. We're going to give people a couple minutes to log in and join us. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Extreme Weather and Heat-Related Illnesses. This is Jacqueline, and I'll be moderating the event today. I'd like to go over a few items before we jump into our presentation. In efforts to minimize background noise, we have muted all attendees. We encourage questions, comments through the presentation using the chat box located on the right-hand side of your screen. This applies to any technical assistance you may need, as well as submitting questions about the information covered. Today, we have Lee Frankhauser, Kevon Pafa, both senior EHS consultant, consultants for BSI, as well as Anna Lee Robbins, an intelligent analyst with BSI. With that being said, I'm going to toss it over to Lee. Good afternoon or good morning to you all, and thank you for joining us on, on this webinar. My topic for discussion today is uh, environmental compliance as it relates to extreme weather. Next slide, please. So although extreme weather has been around for quite a long time, I mean, obviously there's been extremes through history, um, but the, the, um, the frequency and intensity of the, of the extreme weather that has been felt across the nation and across the world, frankly, uh, is a result of climate change um, and and steps are needing to be taken uh, to prepare for and address those extremes as they as they come through. Uh, recent headlines that are in the news, and and I'm sure that there have been more since I just took a spin through and and put these up. Um, the first is a perfect recipe for extreme wildfire. New Mexico's record record breaking early fire season. Um, and that and I think that everyone's aware of. The fires in California that have occurred over the past years, uh, and in Washington, uh, these these fires are a result of extremely dry weather that's coming through, uh, causing the uh, the areas to become extremely prone to any type of fire, which which then spreads extraordinarily fast and is becoming a, a much more prevalent concern out there for those that live in that area of the, of the country. Uh, flooding and landscape landslides kill at least 106 people in northeastern Brazil um, due to extreme rain. Uh, the Marine Corps is considering abandoning Paris Island amid rising extreme weather threats, and that is, you know, that's something that's that's extraordinary. Uh, in that 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 facility has been around for 100 years training Marines, and and uh, and for them to consider picking up and going because uh, their parade grounds are, are underwater half the year uh, is just a is a uh, is a snapshot in, in what is being considered throughout the country and including in, uh, the insurance um, industry 
when they're looking at properties or facilities that are near water bodies. Um, and just uh, to mention, the insurance uh, climate change is hurting insurance industry. So, uh, I mean, the insurance the insurance industry is absolutely taking note of of the changes in the climate and the extreme weather that is a result of that. Um, and they are implementing policy to uh, obviously uh, limit their risk. And and I mean, an example of that is uh, uh, when Sandy came through, when Hurricane Sandy came through the Northeast, um, the Army Corps had to come in to uh, the states along the East Coast and redo the floodplain maps uh, that that had been established for you know the lap, for a hundred years in this area. Um, and as a result of those revised maps, many of many houses that were along the shore were now in the flood area and they needed to be either raised above the the flood zone or they couldn't get insurance. Um, so I mean it. The in insurance industry is taking note of this. The the military is taking uh, note of this. Um, and then we also see climate change continues to impact Lake Mead and the Colorado River. Uh, so, uh, and those aren't the only ones uh, that are being affected. Lake Powell uh, in Arizona, Great Salt Lake in Utah, Lake Shasta in California. Uh, all these lakes are experiencing historic low levels of water. Um, and and mead, I think, is is at such a low level that they're thinking that it may stop producing electricity for the first time since since they started uh, doing that. So, I mean, it's it's extraordinary uh, the um, the impact that extreme weather is having uh, is extraordinary. And California is is under an extreme um, drought right now, where where people that are in remote areas of the of the state are are having to consider not being able to obtain water at all. So I mean it's it's a serious concern. Uh, yeah, next slide. So uh, as far as environmental regulations, one one thing that I want to talk about is what not only what um, industry has to do to comply with regulation, but also how regulations are changing as a result of of the change in climate and the extreme weather that's resulting. Um, so environmental regulations are constantly changing uh, and more weight is being given to stricter regulatory requirements as the costs in both money and lives become greater and more frequently felt. Examples of legislative changes recently adopted uh, are listed here. These are just a few. There are obviously more, and and states are taking, you know, their own route for this. Uh, and but the Biden administration uh, has implemented climate action on three tracks. They're they're going through executive orders from the White House, legislation, and Congress. Uh, policy changes in federal agencies. The administration's stated goals include pollution-free power sector by 2035 and a net zero emission economy by 2050. And I know that that also has been adopted in the state of New Jersey by the governor, by Governor Murphy. Uh, global warming chemicals, a final rule was issued in uh, September 21 to phase down U.S. production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons by 85% over the next 15 years. Uh, in transportation, final federal greenhouse gas emission standards uh, issued on, on December 21 for passenger cars and light trucks for 2023 through 2026. Um, and oil and gas, the EPA issued a proposed rule on, on November 21 that would sharply reduce methane and other harmful air pollution from both new and existing sources in the oil and natural gas industry. So uh, despite the fact that there, you know, there's a major pushback on trying to re put more regulation on energy production and uh, and and fossil fuel uh, consumption, I, the overall drive that that we're seeing um, in you know nationally is to put more regulation on, try to limit the amount of hydrocarbons being um, burned, and cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
as a result of and trying to address the climate change and the effect which is extreme weather. Um, in addition to uh, the, the regulatory changes, there's pressure being felt from uh, environmental, social, and governance, governance uh, that are uh, affecting the way that, that um, companies are performing their own work and the policies that they are implementing for themselves. Uh, climate change is, is one of the hottest considerations for investors who give priority to environmental, social, and governance risks at companies that share that whose shares they own, um, and employees demand that the companies become more sustainable. That is something uh, that we're seeing in our sustainability group, uh, where um, companies are are looking at their um, they uh, their excuse me, um, I lost myself here for a second. Um, their ESG numbers, their, their environmental, social, and government numbers, and, and saying, how can we be better? Because the people that we work for don't want to work with us unless our, unless our environmental, social, and governance considerations are up to par. So they, so they need to make changes for, to work with one another. Next slide, please. Uh, and this this table just kind of gives an overview of what I'm talking about here. Uh, the pressures to act on climate change felt by companies from different stakeholders. The the most eye catching on this on this table or chart, should I say, is that regulators and the government are listed as number four as reasons why companies are are making changes to become more green. Uh, the, the number one reason that companies are making changes is because of their clients and their customers. It's a demand of them. Um, and then internally, because of that, it's the board members and management. And then number three is employees. Uh, employees want to join a company that is uh, environmentally sound and proactive. So I so it's so having the social drive for change is one of the considerations that companies are now having to take to meet with environmental regulations and also uh, to drive to drive further and more aggressive regulations. Next slide, please. So what do you do? Um, the companies need to, when they're looking at, at, or it doesn't have to be a company, it can be a, a job site or, or it can be a, a water treatment plant, but places that can be affected by extreme weather need to look at their emergency response plan and make sure that it is up to date and, uh, takes into account recent changes that we've had in the weather and extremes in weather that that uh, could go beyond anything that has been uh, seen at a site you know to date but you need to prepare for those for those extremes so what to do uh, as far as the first uh, be you know uh, excuse me for preparedness um, assessment of vulnerability and risk. Uh, look at your at your place of work and determine what what parts of the business are are potential potentially vulnerable to uh, you know flooding if you're by if you're in an area that that can be flooded or uh, if you're at risk for drought and fires. You know what can you be doing to uh, limit the potential impact of that type of extreme on your on your facility excuse me first um <clears throat> so if there's if there are uh pipes that are above ground that could float in a flood uh you may want to uh cover them up with with uh some type of weighted cover so that should a flood occur the pipes don't float or if there's an above ground tank 
same type of thing, strapping it down. Or if you're in a um, fire risk, clearing the, the vegetation from around the perimeter of your facility and you know, taking measures, uh, steps to limit the impact that a fire could have on your facility. Or wind, if you have above ground um, electrical lines that could be um, taken down by a tree fall or something like that, you may wanna trim the trees around the, the nearby lot overhead lines or consider putting your electrical supply on underground. These are things that you can look at, uh, assess the vulnerability that you may have to the extremes that may be coming and, uh, and determine what you can do to minimize the impact of, of extreme weather on your facility. Uh, so the second is select and implement the mitigation. So you've you've reviewed your vulnerability. It's time to to act. Um, and so you know putting those those plans in place to uh, minimize the potential issues associated with with a extreme weather condition uh, would go a long way to to preventing a shutdown or or other extreme concern that could that could affect your, your place of business. Updating your contacts and communications, making sure that, they're, that they are up to date, that they're accurate, and that should an emergency uh, uh, take place, that, that proper contacts can be made. And making sure that, that the plans that you've put in place at, the, at your facility with regard to extreme weather um, are presented to the employees of the of the of your place of business and that you're training to make sure that should something happen that that the that the personnel at the facility know what to do uh, and they're doing it properly um, so res your response uh, to to an event uh, would be to assess the event and the site conditions what has occurred what issues have been observed what remedies have worked and what didn't uh, prioritization of, of, of what steps will need to be taken to address um, what has occurred at the site and evaluate resources and implement responses. Then recovery, recovering your, your, your facility and reassessment. So po post event reporting, lessons learned uh, and review of new technologies and guidance. So, you know, what to do here is, a, is your typical uh, continuous improvement cycle where, you know, you're identifying issues that need to be tackled, uh, you're planning on what to do about them, you're executing the plan that you've put in place, and you're reviewing or assessing the successes or failures that you've had based on an event. It's the best thing that you can do to, to prepare for extreme weather. Next slide, please. So resources, there are some excellent resources for you to review uh, as you prepare for extreme weather. Um, there's the EPA Gov natural disasters. All, you know, we're talking about extreme weather. These break, the EPA breaks it down into individual types, but it gives you an overview of how you can prepare when you're doing your assessment. Uh, and and what you can do to limit your exposure to these these types of events. So it's an excellent resource to go to and take a look through, and and then bring those things in those potential issues into your own emergency response plan, so that it's a strong document. And another resource that are another resources that that are very good and worthy of review are located in the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. The precautionary measures for wastewater and stormwater before, during, and after major weather events. Um, so that's kind of focused, but it's also an, it's a really great overview of what, what can be done for really a wide array of different types of business businesses. And technical guidance planning for and response to catastrophic events. Another excellent resource for review as you prepare your emergency response plan and bolster up your, your place of business for potential extreme weather events. So that's all I have.
Uh, with that, I'd like to hand off to Kayvon Baca, who will be discussing heat-related illnesses. All right, thanks very much, Lee. Uh, my name is Kayvon Baca. I'm a senior EHS consultant here with BSI. And for today's webinar, I'm gonna be talking about extreme weather, specifically as it relates to heat and heat-related illnesses. Next slide, please. So first I wanted to paint a little picture of our rising temperatures that are occurring not only in the U.S. but across the globe. Uh, based on this data that we've included here, that the Earth's temperature has been recorded as to be rising about 0.14 degrees Fahrenheit per decade since 1880. And I think what's more alarming than that is that over the last 40 years since 1981, that rate of warming has more than doubled. The National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration has actually reported that 2020 was the second warmest year that they've ever recorded based on their temperature data as well. And other things um, impact climate change and rising temperatures. Carbon pollution, uh, they report that if it continues to build in the atmosphere at current rates, that most of the U.S. could actually see 20 or 30 additional days each year with temps above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the southeast part of the U.S. could be hit especially hard, experiencing 40 to 50 days each year with high temps above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So rising temperatures also mean rising heat. And I want to talk a little bit more in the next slide about how these rising temperatures can impact worker safety. So these global temperatures that are increasing, they can obviously impact worker safety from a heat-related uh, illness standpoint in different ways. Taking a couple of points here, uh, these temps can create heat waves in parts of the country where they have never been seen in the past or rarely seen. <clears throat> Excuse me, a great example of this is last year in June, uh, Portland, which typically has weather in the nice mild 70 degree area, uh, the heat wave came through and it caused temps to reach more than 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's a big swing and unfortunately there were hundreds of fatalities that occurred just from that single heat wave alone. These increasing global temps can also extend the length and intensity of heat waves. So in areas where heat waves may already occur, such as where I live, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Bay Area, it can actually extend how long they last and actually increase the intensity of those heat waves. And these new and longer lasting heat waves uh, can obviously impact worker safety in different ways. One of the ways is that it can increase the time needed for workers to acclimate to the heat. And we're going to talk a little bit more about acclimating to the heat in the upcoming slides. But just note that usually acclimatization peaks in most workers within about four to 14 days of regular work for at least two hours per day in the heat. So we've talked about the fact that temperatures are on the rise and we know that those rising temperatures can impact worker safety and cause more heat related illnesses. So let's talk a little bit more about heat related illnesses and what they are. Next slide, please. All right, so many of us have probably heard the term heat-related illness in the past. It's a serious medical condition. It results from our body's inability to cope with a particular heat load. These illnesses are often grouped together as hyperthermia. Many of us have probably heard the term hypothermia as it relates to cold stress. Hyperthermia cover, uh, covers heat-related illnesses, and it refers to any condition where our body is unable to properly maintain its core temperature and handle the burdens of heat stress. So what is heat stress? Heat stress is the overall heat burden or load on our body, and it's influenced by different things, but they're primarily three categories of influence, body heat, environmental factors, and personal risk factors. We'll be looking at a, a couple examples of those in the upcoming slides. Heat-related illnesses include, in order from least to most severe, heat rash, heat cramps, heat syncope, which is also known as fainting, and the two most uh, deadly, potentially deadly threats in terms of a heat illness standpoint are heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And I think this is a good time for me to share my personal story with heat related illness. Uh, it was about 20 years ago and I was uh, doing work as a uh, oversight for environmental uh, well drilling on an active gas station in Los Altos, California. It was the middle of the summer. Um, this is something that I had done for many, many years uh, very used to working out in that type of weather. We had our shade canopy up. And you know, my level of in intensity in terms of labor was pretty minimal in terms of what the crews were doing, uh, overseeing, taking some soil logs, et cetera. Uh, end of the day, everything was going great. We felt fine, started breaking down the work zone, uh, headed over to the truck after a long day's work and we're getting ready to leave the site. 
as soon as I got over to the truck, it had felt like I had been punched in the face by Mike Tyson, for lack of a better description. Uh, my, I noticed my elevated heart rate. I started sweating a lot. Uh, I started getting nauseous. I started getting dizzy. Um, so I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, I was getting a little bit panicked. I tried to cool down my temperature by going inside to the gas station. Um, that didn't work, so my coworker had driven me home, at which time I took my temperature. And it was 103 degrees, uh, my temperature at the time. Took a cold shower, um, that didn't help. But the moral of the story, the point of the story I bring up, I should say, is not to really identify what I did right or what I did wrong. The point is that heat-related illness is a serious threat to workers. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about how much of a threat it actually is. Next slide, please. So heat wave, I'm sorry, heat continues to be one of the leading causes of weather-related fatalities year in and year out. Uh, each year, dozens of workers die and thousands more become ill while working not only in extreme heat, but also in humid conditions. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports between 1992 and 2017 that heat stress injuries alone killed over 800 U.S. workers and seriously injured more than 70,000. And those, seriously inju uh, those serious injuries uh, typically led to at least one or more days away from work. In 2020 alone, 56 fatalities occur from heat extreme heat. So as we can see from these stats that, um, and my personal story, that heat illness is a real threat. It can affect anyone regardless of their age or their physical conditioning. And I think there's a, a common misconception that heat illness can only impact workers uh, that are doing work outdoors. For example, uh, construction, agriculture, landscaping, oil and gas extraction. But uh, it can also impact workers that are working indoors, especially if they're working in areas or uh, with high equipment or high temperature equipment, or even in areas where they might be working in high heat processes such as manufacturing, et cetera. So there are different um, industries that are, you know, this is an ill, this is a real threat, apologies, but it doesn't just cover outdoor. It also covers indoor as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about the regulations as they apply at both of those coming up. Next slide, please. So we know that heat illness is a real threat. Um, now, how do we protect workers from heat illnesses? I wanted to take the chance to talk about this in this slide and the next slide that, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are a lot of challenges when it comes to protecting workers from heat illness. So often, um, and, and a lot of these bullet points here are gonna be what I think uh, to be considered overlooked in terms of, you know, and why they're challenging to protect workers, that often we only think about the temperature. You know, we don't think about the environmental and personal factors. You may recall I mentioned those. So uh, environmental factors might be things like uh, the humidity level, the uh, lack of wind. Uh, personal factors could be lack of acclimating to the temperature, uh, poor physical conditioning, overconsumption of caffeine or alcohol. And a lot of those times, those things get overlooked. It can happen to all ages and genders of workers, even physically fit and acclimated workers. And a worker may not always exhibit the symptoms of heat illness in order from least to most severe. So it can come on very, very quickly. As in my story, I did not experience heat cramps. I did not experience heat rash. Uh, looking back on it, it seems that I went directly from feeling okay straight to heat exhaustion. Um, so it can, uh, it can progress very, very quickly. I consider heat uh, to be an invisible hazard. And what do, what do I mean by that? You know, take a worker working on top of a, a four-story building at a construction site with an unprotected leading edge. That hazard is basically right there in your face. You know that there is a huge fall hazard and the risk associated with working without fall protection. But heat is more of an invisible hazard. And I failed to recognize uh, heat as that hazard when I was working outdoors that day. And so it often is overlooked as a serious threat because we don't have direct visibility to the hazard itself. And the susceptibility varies from worker to worker. So one worker may be fine and conditioned and be working out 93, uh, 95 degree weather just fine, but somebody on the crew uh, working in that same um, temperature may not be acclimated and may not be able to handle that heat as well. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit more about the challenges about protecting workers from heat related illnesses. Uh, we all know that production demand and physically demanding tasks can cause workers to push themselves beyond their abilities. When we do this and when we allow workers to do this, it greatly increases the chances of heat-related illnesses occurring. 
Heat-related illnesses can occur at low to moderate temps. We all think, wow, it's 100 degrees outside. You know, obviously heat is gonna be a real threat, but it's been reported that heat-related illnesses can occur at temperatures even below 65 degrees Fahrenheit when those workers are performing really, really labor-intense activities. Uh, the heat, uh, the urban heat island effect. This is one that I've also experienced personally, but I, I won't share my story on it, but it was working out in the, in the middle of a gas station in Modesto. And what is the urban heat island? So it occurs when cities replace their natural land cover with dense concentrations of pay, uh, pavement, concrete, buildings, asphalt, and all of those materials absorb and retain the heat. And I think this graphic to the right here from the National Weather Service really does illustrate this perfectly, that if it's 102 degrees outside, for example, in direct sun, blacktop can get to 167 degrees. And at that temperature, that is beyond the temperature at which uh, human skin is instantly destroyed. So that urban heat island effect often gets overlooked and it becomes an extra challenge of protecting workers. And last but not least, uh, the importance of acclimating to the heat is overlooked as a key preventative measure. Uh, as we mentioned before, acclimatization occurs uh, with most workers four to 14 days, a minimum of two hours per day working out in the heat. Um, it is really important that we allow our bodies and our workers' bodies time to quote unquote, get used to the heat. And by not doing so, uh, that greatly increases their risk for a heat related illness. So we talked about the challenges of protecting workers. Now let's go to some strategies in protecting workers from heat related illnesses. So monitoring the weather gives, uh, it gives you key information, especially for supervisors, and it allows them to get the information they need to adjust work schedules and intensity accordingly. So rotating physically intense work tasks between crew members, scheduling intense work uh, for the least hot parts of the day, which is typically outside of the hours of 12 to four, and rescheduling the work, basically canceling the work during high heat and heat waves when possible. OSHA has a great heat safety tool app. It's available for free across um, all platforms. I highly recommend, if you don't have it already, uh, to download it. It gives you um, heat warnings. It can also be used to calculate the heat index and give you a better idea of the risks to workers depending upon the temperature and the environmental conditions. Water, rest, and shade. This is what OSHA's mantra has been for quite some time now, and I call them the big three in protecting workers from heat illness. For water, ensuring at least one quart per hour per employee for the entire work shift. Scheduling, and even more important in my opinion, enforcing those water and rest breaks to make sure that employees are staying hydrated. And ensuring shade is present or available depending upon the temperature. At 80 degrees, for example, Calo should require shade to be present. Now, a running vehicle with air conditioning on can serve as shade, and I, we have had to use that as our shade means when we're working remotely. So allowing for acclimatization, again, the importance of allowing our bodies to get used to the heat is very key in helping us prevent heat related illnesses. Training employees on the risks and controls associated with heat illnesses, um, understanding what the risks are of working out in the heat, um, understanding what control measures such as water, rest and shade they need to follow and make sure that they are following them to make sure they are doing everything that they can proactively to prevent uh, a heat related illness. Next slide, please. So one last slide here about some strategies in protecting workers. Monitoring employees for signs of heat stress. So not only training employees to know what to look for in themselves, but also uh, in others. Um, and this becomes even more important for supervisors as well. <clears throat> they should also be trained to be able to identify and monitor and know what to look for. Understanding worker limitations. It's been shown that workers over 40 are more prone to heat stress and heat illnesses. So really understanding those personal risk factors and not taking a one size all fits approach to every person that's on the crew is really important to preventing heat related illnesses as well. Enforcing the right type of clothing. Uh, this one does get overlooked from time to time, but just by wearing the right type of clothing, it is a huge benefit to preventing heat related illness. Light colored, lightweight, moisture wicking and fast dry fiber blends. They do a great job at combating heat stress through a process called evaporative cooling, which basically allows our skin to remain dry, pulling the sweat away, which is how our bodies deal with heat stress and allowing that uh, sweat to cool off of the body. Provide and have workers use sunscreen. Um, I'll be honest, I honestly didn't know this uh, until recently that sunburn increases the likelihood of heat illness. So 
Uh, preventing sun, uh, sunburn in the first place is really important, providing a minimum SPF 15 every two hours to the skin. And the last bullet point here is train for emergency procedures, as well as high heat procedures with kick in and calosha uh, at 95 degrees. So it becomes really important when you have crews working in remote areas, making sure that you have reliable communication in those areas and that workers know their exact location. So if there is an emergency, they can call for EMS promptly and they can get there uh, uh, very, very quickly. Next slide, please. So for the last slide in my segment here, briefly touching on what regulations are currently in place and what's upcoming down the pipeline to protect workers from heat related illness. So certain states already have uh, heat illness standards in place, including California, Minnesota, Oregon, and Washington. Now for states that don't have a state run plan and they follow federal OSHA, the duty to protect employees against heat illness falls under the general duty clause. Certain states and federal OSHA are actually in process of creating and implementing new or additional heat illness prevention standards. For example, Cal OSHA is currently implementing a heat illness prevention standard for indoor places of employment, and that's expected to be implemented in 2023. The current regulations only apply to outdoor places of employment. And federal OSHA is in process of creating not only standards for outdoor, but also for indoor places of employment as it relates to heat illness prevention. So I think these regulations, the current and upcoming, really, really show the importance uh, this, and, and the highlight that this has been taking over the last couple of years that um, regulations are going to be put in place to protect employees. Uh, and it's it's completely preventable. I think that's the main takeaway that I wanted uh, to send here is that these fatalities, these injuries are completely preventable. And uh, hopefully, in addition to these uh, protective measures and regulations, we can prevent these happening from uh, employees in, in the future. So thank you very much. I hope you found that beneficial. I'm going to go ahead and pass on to Anna Lee Robbins. Anna. Thank you so much. That was really um, thorough and, and interesting. Um, my name is Annalie Robbins, and I'm going to be looking at um, extreme weather through the lens of our global intelligence team. So we'll be making kind of um, kind of a shift here. Um, I know that my colleagues have already discussed how to prepare, adapt, and respond to extreme weather events, but I'll now be switching over to kind of look at more of how we can predict events, anticipate them, and what we're doing to help um, cover you in BSI Connect Screen Intelligence. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to go over this really quickly, I'm going to begin by discussing briefly with you all an overview of what's trending today and a variety of the impacts they're causing to supply chains, followed by some predictions and analysis for weather events all pulled together by our intelligence team. To wrap things up, I'll be highlighting the way these events are all covered in screen. Next slide. 2021 was a pivotal year for climate commitments with both governments and companies alike committing to new environmental and net zero commitments. 2021's UN Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26, was an important turning point in the corporate world for environmental issues. In 2021, many companies made emissions and waste reduction commitments after calls from regulators, investors, and stakeholders. In 2022, companies will need to draft plans to back up commitments with action and quantify changes using science-based targets. Companies will need to demonstrate action on commitments with the implementation of standards and opportunities for carbon reduction and waste reduction. It should be noted that the ESG and climate regulatory space is fast moving, with environmental disclosure laws being drafted and implemented in the United Kingdom, European Union, United States, Norway, Australia, Switzerland, and more. COP27, to be held in November of 2022 in Egypt, will likely have governments make increased commitments ahead of schedule as governments work to close the gap between commitments and the carbon budget agreed upon by the scientific community. But companies are also facing pressure from civic and climate groups to not engage in greenwashing, a term commonly used to describe corporate climate commitments not backed up with measurable action. Next slide, please. So moving on and switching our focus on to some more specific weather and climate related issues, we'll talk first about the ongoing severe drought in Africa. 
multiple regions in Africa, including the Horn of Africa and Southern Africa, as seen here in this image on the right, are experiencing worsening droughts after multiple failed rain seasons. These droughts have the potential to cause a devastating humanitarian crisis as the drought has devastated agriculture and livestock populations, as well as impact the security of supply chains in the region through an increased threat of stowaways, shortages, and social unrest. Although Africa does periodically face challenging droughts, this drought affecting the Horn of Africa in particular is the worst since 1981. Experts attribute the worsening of droughts in Africa to climate change and its impact on weather patterns, which have the potential to worsen drought conditions significantly in the medium and long term. These weather patterns are likely to exacerbate the already significant pattern of economic instability as millions face hunger. I will discuss the related shortage of critical food supplies later on in this presentation a little bit more, but it should be noted that this may also place a premium on goods transiting through the region, potentially heightening security concerns. Next slide, please. Switching over to how weather can impact corporate social responsibility risks, the ongoing heat wave in India could potentially exacerbate the already prevalent risk of facility fires throughout the country. During the past month, Northwest India and Pakistan have experienced record high temperatures, with some reports indicating that pre-monsoon temperatures could continue to rise, potentially reaching temperatures as high as 122 degrees Fahrenheit. In April, India's Prime Minister reportedly stated that the high temperatures are contributing to an increase in fires for buildings. We've already recorded multiple notable facility fires in recent weeks, including one on May 13th when a fire broke out inside of a four-story commercial building in Munka, located in the outskirts of Delhi. At least 27 people were reportedly killed in the blaze. Overall, businesses with facilities in Northwest India should be wary of the potential for increased facility fires during this heat wave. Poor building construction quality coupled with the lack of upkeep and an inadequate health and safety inspectorate contributes to the significant risk of facility fires across the country. Fires in warehouses and manufacturing facilities, oftentimes caused by short circuits, are very common and occur across all sectors, most commonly in consumer products, agriculture, food and beverage, and apparel. In March, a 7.3 magnitude earthquake was reported off the coast of Fukushima Prefecture with authorities from the Japan Meteorological, Meteor, Meteorological <laughs> Agency, JMA, issuing tsunami advisories soon after for the Miyagi and Fukushima prefectures. The earthquake also led to the suspension of operations at several facilities across Ibaraki, Miyagi and Yamagata prefectures, including at least two semiconductor manufacturing plants, several electronic components facilities, two automotive factories, and one of Japan's largest oil refineries. Additionally, officials halted services for a bullet train and closed at least one major highway. Some of the most expensive natural disasters in the world have taken place in Japan, and within the past decade, natural disasters have cost the country hundreds of billions of dollars. The, the country is prone to earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, typhoons, and periodic snowstorms, and is located near major tectonic plate boundaries and also on the Pacific Ring of Fire, making it prone to major earthquakes. While the nation has advanced warning systems, oh, sorry, if we could stay on that slide. Thank you. While the nation has advanced warning systems and well-developed emergency management plans, the frequency of natural disasters in the country will continue to hinder business continuity. Despite these threats and the immense cost of them, investment into Japan is safe and the country's debt is not considered a substantial threat to the nation's credit or banking system. Now we can switch sides. Thank you. So at the end of May, a torrential rainstorm in the area of Recife, Brazil, triggered a landslide that claimed the lives of at least 91 people. But according to what I think Lee said earlier, it was up to at least 106. Um, floods are overwhelmingly the most frequent type of natural disaster that occurs in Brazil, and the country averages two to five major floods per year. Mud and landslides, droughts, and storms also occur in Brazil, albeit at a much lower degree of regularity than floods. However, actually, droughts tend to impact the highest proportion of the country's population, followed by flooding. 
Historically, Brazil has not been exposed to major natural disasters. However, multiple floods and mudslides, as well as droughts in recent years, suggest that the country is becoming increasingly at risk to natural disasters. The heavily populated southeast region of Brazil, including the states of Rio de Janeiro, Minas Gerais, Sao Paulo, and Espírito Santo, most frequently experience heavy rains that can lead to flooding and landslides, windstorms, hail, frost, and droughts. Although this was not necessarily the case here, it should be noted that disastrous floods and landslides oftentimes follow droughts as the dried ground is unable to absorb rain quickly enough, thus allowing the rain to flow quickly over land and flood the surrounding areas. Next slide, please. Chile is struggling with a record-breaking drought that is causing significant water issues in the region as well. The country is entering the 13th year of this punishing drought and that has resulted in lower water levels and caused the country's capital to begin water rationing procedures. This is especially significant for the agriculture and mining industries. Agriculture is the main water user around the city and water cutbacks can be especially hard for this industry. And the mining industry, which relies heavily on water, is also facing a decrease in the production of around 17% and a 24% decline in output at at least one mine outside Santiago due to water constraints. Looking forward, as Santiago continues to fight droughts with water rationing, businesses in the region will have to be cognizant of the inherent risks to operating within the city and region. In fact, as of just last week, experts are warning Chile's water issues are so severe that they may lead to economic, social, and environmental issues yet experienced by water scarcity. This just really reiterates the fact that this crisis has reached a national security level. Next slide. Another topic that, oops, excuse me. Um, moving forward and more into the predictions and analysis lens here, um, considering all of these dramatic upticks and, you know, these storms we've seen in the United States, for example, landslides and floods in the Americas um, and heat waves in India, our intelligence team is actually tracking these incidents and we're recording all of these um, severe floods as well as their economic losses and um, how this increase in economic growth and urbanization is driving an increase in more disasters and more people are being exposed to floods. Next slide, please. So one more thing really quick that I wanted to touch on that I don't feel we can really avoid when talking about this topic is, not, is how not just politics, but also extreme weather is affecting global food supplies. As I'm sure most of us know, the war in Ukraine has fundamentally changed grain exports and supplies. These changes in logistical patterns may expose grain exports to a variety of new challenges, including smuggling, theft, and food fraud. Formerly, Russia and Ukraine actually supplied around a quarter of the global grain supply, with much of it going to African countries. As noted before, these countries are already experiencing a record-setting drought, and this lack of grain export from Russia and Ukraine further exacerbates this issue. We are also seeing an increasing frequency of governments imposing protectionist policies for food and agricultural products due in part, for example, to the heat wave impacting areas of India. All of these issues are compounding together to create the perfect storm for serious food shortages, again, further exacerbating security, corporate social responsibility, and more risks. Next slide, please. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on how screen is showing um, companies, you know, these, these change and shifts in weather patterns. Um, so kind of the way that we do this is we track these incidents by one, um, observing and databasing the initial incident, tracking it into our portal, and then running analysis on these issues so that you have access to topics like flood control risk, significant up and rainfall in specific geographic risk areas, industries of concern, and more. And you can actually see on this right side of the screen in the bottom um, right image um, how we are actually having to change some of our threat ratings within the system um, due to these, these shifting weather patterns that are linked 
um, at least somewhat, if not, you know, almost all the way to climate change itself. Next screen, please. And I just wanted to conclude this presentation with this image showing an example of how screens mapping capabilities um, can highlight and pinpoint certain natural disaster events. Um, so as we can see here during this screen grab from um, previously in the year, um, you can see that there are two incidents in here um, detailing how certain weather events, one, a wildfire in South Korea, and two, heavy snowfall in India, um, how that's disrupting supply chain operations. Um, and this, this will be covered um, throughout the world in our map as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. I will now um, pass it back to our moderator if we have any questions. Okay, good job, guys. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll wait a couple seconds to see if we have any. As of right now, we don't. All right, it looks like nobody has any questions. Um, so with that, we would we all both would like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email within the next few days, which will include a link to access the webinar recording as well as additional resources. If you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to contact us using the information on the screen shown. Once again, thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.